20, uh, 20 application chapters, and that's, that's really us. So what I'll t talk to you today is just basically a, uh, a brief overview of chapters three, four, five, and six. And that, that, those are going to be, we're going to gloss over those in the, in the time that we have here and give you a little bit of a taste for what it is that we do at Hit Science. So with, with chapter one, and just to introduce the area with high intensity interval training, what is it? We need to define that first. And it's really, it's, you know, it's exercise consisting of repeated bouts of high intensity work that's performed above your lactate threshold, you know, a, a, an effort that's perceived as hard, it's in your red zone. Um, so it's, yeah, it's above that threshold. That's by definition, it needs to be, uh, exercise needs to be above that, uh, that demarcation point. And then it's of course separated by periods of rest. So as we always love to say, there's loads of ways to skin the cat when it comes to training. But in general, those are the, the, the five formats or weapons that we have. And, and you know, we can, you can see they're there that we can have, um, sorry, we can have long intervals, short intervals, uh, you know, repeated short sprints, repeated long sprints. And then we can use these in the team sport context as well. And they can become small sided games. Uh, and yeah, these all form very useful weapons or, or tools that we can use to bring into practice. Um, also, we just want to acknowledge that, you know, HIT is just one piece of the performance puzzle, of course, but it's often a very important one. And it's also often one of the most uh, versatile uh, pieces of the puzzle that you, you know, you actually have a little bit of control on as a, as a practitioner. So it's, it's why it's uh, a useful one to actually have some understanding in. So whenever you're going to actually begin the process and apply your, your, um, your interval training, you always, of course, have to look at the context. So what's around you? What are, what sport are we talking about? What's the athlete? What's the, um, yeah, the athlete in front of you and their, their profile, their psychological state? Uh, what sort of long-term adaptations are we, are we after if we're looking at the big picture? Uh, what are the, you know, the events of the day and what's kind of coming around this? And then once we bring all those into, uh, into play, then we can start to, to really work on our content. So what's the desired physiological objectives of the session? What sort of metabolism are we, um, are we trying to invoke? The neuromuscular load. Do we want to integrate sports specific skills, cognitive load, uh, how much volume and intensity? And those are all content based um, factors. So let's just give an example. So we've got three different sports here. So we've got, uh, you know, uh, we've got a triathlete, we've got a rower, and we've got a, um, a football player, All right? So let's just, let's just take the rower, for example, we can break that, we can reverse engineer the, the sport, and we can see that, you know, the power that's required over uh, 2000 meters is, you know, it's a direct, fairly linear uh, relationship between the power at VO2 max. So VO2 max is obviously going to be one of the, the key factors that's of, of importance. We'll want to have hit sessions that are catered to, uh, to target VO2 max. So what are those? We take the, uh, the triathlete as well, the same, same sort of thing. We get a, a linear relationship between the, the, the athlete's VO2 peak and, and their race time. Once again, we can do, you know, intervals that are specific to enhancing VO2 max. Uh, so yeah, everything down in the endurance context here, you've, you've, uh, may have seen these on the hit science uh, social pages. You know, we've, uh, these sorts of sports are very endurance based. They're very physical. They're quite simple to, to program. Um, and yeah, this is, and they have, I guess, uh, mid-based uh, aspects of speed and strength. Sorry, oh, shoot. <laughs> Trying to get rid of the pull here. Um, Steve, not sure what I do here. I think because as I'm a, an administrator, uh, da, da, da. maybe I just close it. Steve's not listening. Okay. We'll keep no, I going. am listening. I was on mute. Sorry. Uh, just close it. Sorry, Paul. Okay. Closed it up. Yep. So moving on, if we're taking the, uh, the team sport approach or the, um, you know, the, the soccer player, Martin's, Martin's context, well, is, you know, 
is physical uh, ability necessarily the uh, most important thing? Now you can see it's shifting. It's mostly skill and tactics that are playing a much larger, uh, a larger um, a component to, to performance. So we need to be very clear on that as conditioners. So take this for example, you're looking at, um, you know, some, this, the, you know, basically try to pay attention how much physical prowess is involved in this. Not a lot. It's so skill and, and uh, tactical based in terms of the outcome. So when we're practitioners and coming into this setting, we need to be very clear on uh, what it is that we're bringing the to the table. And, um, you know, when, when other aspects are of importance, we need to be able to stand, stand aside. Uh, I was guilty of, of that when I was working in the Olympic program in New Zealand. So again, important message for me. So being fitter and faster can't necessarily guarantee success in all sports. Uh, however, not being fit and fast enough can be a problem. Uh, but in often when we look to the team sport context, which is a lot of our sports, it's skills, it's player interactions, it's game insights um, that are the number one when it comes to performance. And physical, we, we do need physical capacities though to, com to cope with the demands of the match um, and for players to execute their tactical roles efficiently and for those, uh, those um, physical attributes to fit within the game model of the team. Okay, so context is, is, needs to be really clear before we go and set out our program, All right? So again, just look at the, the differences there between triathlon and, and, and football in terms of the physical performance. So easy for me to apply my physical, um, uh, my, my physical uh, programming to my triathletes, maybe not as uh, easy for, for Martin sometimes to, um, to apply his. But when we, take, uh, the, when we take hit as an example, we've got a, you know, a great opportunity to be able to move this, this, uh, the hit session around to accommodate all of the other components of training that are of importance, such as you know, strength, speed, activation sessions. We can manipulate the hit session and place it in various different places so that it doesn't interfere with potentially other more important, um, uh, more important components of the training plan of the microcycle. And that's really what we try to teach within hit science is how you can cater, how you can cater a hit session to be able to um, yeah, make it most appropriate in, in the microcycle. So that kind of kind of um, going to advance into Dr. Fife's uh, chapter, the hit and concurrent training. Again, this is when we when we do do version two, I think we'll probably place this chapter earlier but but yeah just to begin there within the the concurrent training program so your your strength and conditioning sessions this is led by dr jackson fife from deakin university in melbourne and yeah it really covers the uh the concurrent training and the interference effect right we know that when we're looking at uh endurance metabolic training versus our strength um uh, type type training obviously they're, they're completely uh, different in terms of the signaling and the adaptations that you get right so you know increased o2 delivery mitochondria in the endurance side strength and muscle hypertrophy power development on the on the strength side so how do you how do you uh, mix and meld the two and really the, when it comes down to to make a long story short you really need to look at the neuromuscular effect that you're um, that you're having and we don't want to be able to blunt that for the session that is of importance, whether that's coming, whether the neuromuscular uh, aspect, it may be more critical for an endurance athlete or the, the endurance component, right? Like a key hit session, for example, in my context, or maybe um, the strength component in, uh, in like a football player or whatnot. So that, that we might not want to um, you know, interfere with the adaptations or the quality of that session. So again, HIT can be very useful when we're trying to uh, you know, cater the right session so that we don't interfere with the, the session that we might prioritize. So here we're kind of coming back to chapter three now, and we're gonna to start to just understand a little bit the, the physiological uh, targets uh, that we get from a HIT session. Okay, so 
what we did with this chapter is we we took Albert, uh, we took this this quote. I'm not sure if Albert uh, mentioned it or not, but everything should be made as, as simple as possible, but not simpler. And so we break down a hit session into its three main components, right? So you're going to get an uh, often get an aerobic response of some uh, some form, heart and lungs. You often get a anaerobic lactic type response because it's high intensity. And then you often get a, a neuromuscular musculoskeletal uh, response to a to a hit session. Okay, so we and we color code these throughout: uh, green for oxidative, red for anaerobic, and black for neuromuscular. Okay, so uh, and yeah, so this is what chapter three is basically just uh, explaining this a little bit more. So typically, when we're looking at a lot of our uh, long and short interval VO2 max sessions and repeated sprint efforts, game-based training. We're, we're really looking at the ability for us to target our central and peripheral uh, aerobic oxidative adaptations. So looking at your cardiac output, you're making that uh, stroke volume larger, enhancing ventricular contraction, uh, doing great respiratory work, uh, at least at the central level. And then at the peripheral level, these adaptations are enhancing things like aerobic enzymes and uh, through their muscle deoxygenation levels, right? So they're, um, we're getting a, you know, that's it's one of the key, you know, possibly, a, you know, the, in terms of a hierarchy, the most important aspect that you get through a, through a hit sessions. Okay, and um, yeah, so, and there's lots of ways to skin the cat. And I, I wrote a paper on this uh, ways back where we can look at both high intensity training and high volume training. They, they both, in their different ways, they can target this, this little um, master switch in the muscle to have all these various downstream effects, all right? So there's lots of ways to do this. You can you could do this for high volume training, lots of lots of Ks, lots of running. You can also uh, do this through high intensity training. Both have a similar, um, they both hit a similar target in the muscle to make their downstream adaptations. So I know this is a pet peeve of a lot of, uh, practitioners that, um, that that see this and they, they see their athletes just running Ks, they're just running, just, just going for a long, easy, slow kind of run. And um, not, you know, it's not always that time efficient. And I guess the question is, is that necessarily the best way to go about conditioning your athletes? Um, yeah, and a lot of us argue that's there's probably a better way to do this, but a lot, this is a tradition that's within so many sports. Uh, okay, moving back to the second target, the, this is the, the anaerobic um, contribution, right? So our lactic response. And so this is important because it's going to be depleting glycogen stocks and uh, influencing subsequent sessions, uh, causes for certainly a, a change in perceived exertion. They're hard, they're you know, you feel the burn and uh, yeah, it can result in change in performance or so lowering in performance in subsequent sessions. So, and then the, the final and yeah, really important and, and less understood, hard to quantify uh, aspect of HIT and, and all the other various different um, sessions that we do is the neuromuscular and the musculoskeletal strain. Right? And this is really important to get our heads around one day because you know, it really affects, probably affects injury risk, uh, definitely affects, affects your fatigue and the quality of your session, perceived exertion, yeah, and that performance. Okay, so those are the three physiological targets of, of HIT. And the cool thing about HIT is that it can be totally catered like Rambo, like a, like a Navy SEAL kind of going in as opposed to a weapon of, of mass destruction. You can go in and actually get a, a HIT session that is you know, exclusively aerobic and neuromuscular, you can make a session aerobic and anaerobic. You can have a session that's, you know, all guns blazing, a little bit more mass destruction like, but it's up to you, the practitioner, depending on how you um, skin the cat, as we like to say, uh, in terms of what you're going to get. Okay, and this is the busy slide that Martin's really led. And, and it's, you know, it, it, here's our, our context. Here's the various different types you might have heard of, all right? So all the various different different hit types, you know, do you want one with no neuromuscular strain and no lactic? Well, that's a, that's a, um, that's an, uh, aerobic type one session down to, you know, all guns blazing, sorry, or type, type four, where you, you know, you can make it, 
um, you know, oxidative, anaerobic, and neuromuscular. And yeah, and then you can see all the various different formats that you can use to get your different types. Again, showing the versatility. So when you get the knowledge of how all of the different, uh, you know, hit formats can, can be used, you can manipulate that physiological response that you get. Okay, so that's, yeah. So we're gonna move next uh, now into the hit formats. All right, so that's chapter, chapter four. Just quickly learn how to, how to manipulate some of those. These are the different weapons. And yeah, for, for this, we, we really talk about how the different factors, and you can see there's, there's big 12 different factors that we can manipulate within a given hit session to change the physiological output, whether we're gonna get that hit type. Okay. And the main ones, of course, are the intensity and the duration of the work bout. Uh, and then possibly also the intensity and the, the duration of the recovery bout. Those would be the key factors. You have to take any um, one thing away. Right. So we'll just start with the intensity. You may have seen this uh, figure here before. So you can see the intensity uh, can be quantified of any interval training session. Remember, there are all above our critical velocity, or critical power, maximal lactate steady state, uh, functional threshold power. They're all above this, but you can see we can have, you know, um, long intervals, uh, short intervals, um, you know, and then up above in the higher range, we've got uh, repeated sprint training and sprint interval training. Okay, and then you've got your, um, your maximal sprinting speed and peak power output uh, in, the, in the, uh, at the very highest range, right? So that's really the range of, of, hit, of hit training. And yeah, you've got, you can see, you can quantify it in terms of your, um, you know, percentage of VO2 max versus that percentage of the maximal sprinting speed. Okay, and these have certain effects on our recruitment, right? So you might have remembered from your basic science the, uh, you know, your, your, your slower, your fast twitch muscle fibers. So obviously the, the upper end of the range, we're going to be recruiting the, um, the type, uh, type 2 fibers, type 2X fibers, which are more um, fatigue, fatiguing versus the type 1 fibers, which are going to be more... Um, uh, I guess fatigue resistant and typically we want to turn those faster twitch fibers into um, I guess making them more oxidative or fatigue resistant more resilient right so that's our critical uh, critical speed or critical velocity it's been known since A.V. Hill in the, um, in the early uh, 1900s and yeah we've also got the anaerobic work capacity so various different aspects of the anaerobic work capacity sitting there and those can be that is, that is really our yeah our um you know anaerobic speed reserve is is a component of how much uh how much we actually you know the match that we decide to light with respect to um you know the hit session okay, so just looking at this when we uh when we're looking at our uh, our various hit sessions, you've got here the, the uh, W prime or the um, amount of, I guess, stored energy that is finite. And you've got, um, just want to make sure that Steve's not trying to message me here. Good. <laughs> no, um, what, sorry, Steve. Just saying it's not me crack on okay good um so yeah basic basically we've got the um yeah the w prime which is our you know our anaerobic uh stored finite stored energy we want to have a hit session that's more in this green uh upper um section here and it is, you, know, you don't want a, a hit session that's um, absolutely like depleting. And that is the, the issue uh, in these subsequent ones here, whether it's potentially done almost, you know, more of that uh, guns blazing all out. And um, yeah, you, you're gonna have a hit session that's ultimately maybe lacking that quality or impairing uh, future sessions. All right, just moving on to the recovery aspect and why that's important for a hit session. We've got, uh, you can see here, the 
um, we're looking really at the recovery aspect of a hit session. And we often think that, oh, um, at least what I learned, uh, recovery should be active because we want to clear out the nauseous blood lactate. But is that actually the case? You can see here in this example, if we're actually looking at the W prime model, um, you know, that anaerobic capacity, we're actually inhibiting our ability of our, our body to replete its oxygen stores and um, to replete the energy ultimately. And you can see that. So here in the active recovery stage, we're actually uh, theoretically reducing that uh, W prime, the stored, stored energy. And that's either if we're doing the active recovery or if our recovery interval between the uh, quality bouts is, is diminished, is too short. So again, it's important to get the recovery intensity and uh, duration correct. And that was demonstrated by Greg DuPont and colleagues in 2004. You can see here they've got an active versus a passive recovery. And they're looking at the, uh, the saturation of oxygen in the muscle cell in, um, you know, in, in basically a 15-15 hit session. And you can see here in the active recovery session, you can almost hypothesize that, that would, initially that would be the better one, but time to exhaustion is halved when you're doing active recovery at like 40% you know, of VO2 max, not that much. You just can't go as long. So you can, again, re if you want a more quality session, you need to get rid of your, your active recovery and have almost have a real passive recovery, again, to get more out of that. Okay, so huge opportunity as a practitioner, if you know this, passive recovery, get maximal recruitment um, for, your, for your hit sessions, or use longer recovery durations uh, if you're gonna be using, um, I guess, the active recovery. Conversely, if you're a practitioner, you've got your athletes for like 15 minutes and you want a maximal aerobic response, well, it's, you, you know, you've better use active recovery in that sort of situation. So again, knowing how to skin the cat is, is really useful as a practitioner. And while there's lots of other factors there, as you can see, but in the interest of time, we'll, we'll kind of move into some of these, uh, the next weapons here. So you can see here we've got, um, when we know all of the various different hit sessions, we can form th these five different um, hit sessions, all right? So formats or, or weapons. So hit with long intervals is the first one. You can see these are two to five minute bouts of exercise with one to, one to four minute relief intervals, right? Typically passive, but they can be active. And these are just done around your VO2 max. I'll show you an example of that in one sec. This is Martin's baby, which is hit at short, short intervals. The, this is the most versatile uh, hit weapon that you can see. Uh, notice that it hits all of the different target types, type ones through type four. You can really do so much with a short interval when you know how to use it. Uh, it's uh, intensity sits around, you know, between 100 and 120% of um, uh, your VO2 max or thereabouts. Okay, and yeah, it can be active or passive. Repeated sprint training. These ones are great because you, they're they're um, you, know, you don't have to calibrate them. They're they're all they're one of your all out uh, hit sessions, and they're you know they're very short short sprints, three to ten seconds, and uh, you know relief intervals of fifteen to sixty seconds, and various different series or um, of those. These are pretty. Um, Difficult, the sprint to interval uh, training sessions, these are your type fives. And for these ones, these are, uh, you know, again, they're all out, so you don't have to calibrate them, but they're longer sprints, 20 to 30 seconds with one to, um, to four minute uh, recovery period. So very lactic, very neuromuscular. And then game-based training, which is the, the team sport uh, context uh, preference hit session, self-selected gameplay, and, and they're, they're really game-based versions of, of long intervals, two to five minutes with uh, one to two minutes of recovery. So that is the, those are the various different uh, weapons. And the very final, I guess, section that I'll do is just to, to try to show you how, how we can fine tune some of these. And we'll speed through this again in the interest of time. But basically, once we know now, we know how to use these, we can you know, select our weapon or select, select our target, know our target, you know, say you want something that's you know, type, uh, type three or type four in terms of these responses. We know we can either use a, 
um, you know, a, a repeated sprint training weapon or a, a long interval and then adjust them and then, then finalize the weapon. So again, here's the long interval. And I gave you that, what that one was, but just an example here of a trap leap. Doing one of these, one of the key factors is the, um, the high breathing, right? So we should be seeing the aerobic response, heavy breathing, and then yeah, and a big lactic response too. So it's type three and type, type four are usually the option to get for this two to five minutes. And they really hurt. There's the breathing. <laughs> and then the short interval, Martin's uh, very versatile one. Okay, so short bouts with, uh, with repeats. It's so versatile because mostly because of the lactic response. Okay, the, the longer, the longer the pauses, when we add the pause of the recovery bout, we can actually achieve a very low lactic session. So it's not that damaging. All right, and this is due to the myoglobin in the, in the muscle. And just take here, for example, we can actually be at near, at or near VO2 max with these 10 and 10 and, and 20, 20 sessions. But notice that the lactate is, uh, is a, it's sitting around four. So super low lactate, but yet you're near VO2 max. So incredibly versatile. And here's an example, just in a World Cup skier from Switzerland. You can push it, push it, push it. So we're getting a large muscle deox uh, deoxygenation, uh, you know, sitting around 120% of, uh, of the O2 max or thereabouts. And then a pause, resaturation, repeat. All right, type three or type four there. This is our Kiwi pair in New Zealand, Dan Flues training them. These are some of the best rowers in the world, doing a 40 20 session at 470 watts. Again, a type three or a type four session. Next one is the repeated sprint training. And I'll pass on that one, but basically this is, I'll just give you the, the, um, uh, the team sport example, and you'll recognize these. Uh, this is John Pryor's session. And this is in a rugby league team, but you can see it's calibrated for different sprints. And these are all out. Five second sprints. 15 seconds rest, 10 seconds. and then repeat. Very useful in the team sport context. The sprint interval training, um, these are really the ones that are, you know, these are, we started a lot with these ones. They're all out, um, very, you know, again, I'm, in the interest of time, I'm gonna move through this, but you know, there's a, there's a vomit bu bucket here for a reason. And uh, yeah, there's a, you know, this is like re repeated wind gates. And then, you know, that can be actually used in the team sport context as well. Two, one, go! Go, 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 go! So very sport specific, but still um, actually adding these are all out. And we can actually now, of course, measure the muscle deoxygenation during these, which is incredible. And then finally, of course, within the team sport context, we've got our game-based training. And these are just basically game-based versions of the, of the long intervals. We can manipulate the player number, game simulation, technical rules, coach encouragement to change the various uh, aspects. <coughs> just summing up, you can just compare the uh, VO2 responses across the weapons, so very oxidative. We typically want to use a, a long interval, a short interval. Um, and or a game game based interval in a team sport context. If we're looking for a glycolytic response, we can see the ones that are uh, the most potent, typically repeated sprint training and sprint interval training. And then the neuromuscular respo uh, response is very context based, largely athlete profile dependent. Yeah, that's why you have uh, as conditioners, you need to keep an eye on them, of course. Um, you know, in, within the endurance context, uh, we, they get low levels of fatigue and, and to speed decrement with it. But the team sport, uh, maybe some higher levels of neuromuscular fatigue. All right, but you, and it's all about finding that sweet spot of uh, positive strain. Not too much, not too little. So uh, again, the key aspect of, of HIT is its versatility and why we want to know how the weapons work 
uh, to be able to use that as a, as a conditioner when we come into our, our, uh, our sporting context. So again, thank you very much, Steve, for the invitation to speak. If you want to know more, please either email me or check out our material at HIT Science. Thank you very much, Paul. Really appreciate your your time and commitment for that as well. Like, um, yeah, like you're going to be, hopefully you'll go for a nap and then you'll be back for the second sort as well. That, 